Hello, everyone. Greetings, and thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Lorena Benedetti, and I'm a research scientist in the lab of Jennifer Lipico's work at Zanilia Research Campus. On behalf of ACB and the Public Information Committee, I would like to welcome you to the second of our series of webinars focused on the intersection between art and science. The goal of our webinar series is to illustrate the close relationship between art and science. Art and science ask and address open-ended questions. Art and science are based on creativity. Both welcome failure as an essential part of the process and the development of one's aptitude in both disciplines occurs by a continuous feedback loop of thinking and doing. Creative work in science and art produces unexpected and surprising results. Surprise stimulates curiosity, which triggers a search to reveal the mystery of things unknown. Last week, Joe Glevy gave a beautiful talk about the early history of microscopes. Our speaker today is Anna Schkop. Anna is a professor in the Department of Genetics and an affiliate faculty member in Life Sciences Communication at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Arts Institute. She mentors both scientists and art students in her lab. Anna is a geneticist, artist, and coloring book author who has utilized these phenotypes to create inclusive learning environments, which she will tell you about today. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Again, thank you everyone for participating. I'm happy to turn the attention to Anna. All right, thank you, Lorena. Appreciate it. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you for coming today. So um, title of my talk is Too Creative for Science, question mark. And this was something that was said to me um, when I was a second year grad student. And it was something that um, kind of changed the course of my career. And I wanted to share you um, sort of my path in science and what I've done with this. So before I get started to tell you about uh, my story, I have to tell you as a geneticist about my genetics. And so, um, um, in, for those of you who know genetics, this is a beginning of a pedigree. And so my father um, was a sculptor and a medical illustrator and also taught anatomy to, med to uh, medical students. And my mom was his grad student and she is a ceramist and also art educator. And they gave they gave uh, birth to four children. I'm the oldest of four. And um, it, your first thought, if you know anything about genetics, I must have inherited a recessive gene for science. But in fact, that's not what's going on here is we all inherited an immense ability, um, immense amount of creativity um, because creativity is involved in both of these fields. Um, and I often I try to say that I may have just butted off my father and became a cell biologist. And the reason why I'm part of ASDB is my father's name was Microscope. That usually gets a lot of laughs, but on this webinar, this is close to me. But um, this is my life growing up and my family. And my sisters are graphic designers. My brother's an industrial designer. They all make about double or triple my salary. So artists do make a lot of money and very good at it. Um, and the home that I grew up in was also, um, also unique. So this is in the basement studio of my home. Here's my dad doing the bust of his football coach. So my dad play also becoming an artist, also unusual is my dad was a, um, classically trained, um, sculptor and painter and, uh, drawer. And he was doing the bust of his football coach, Ben Schroeswater, who's in the football hall of fame. And, and he's famous for coaching, um, Ernie Davis of the Heisman, who, who was at Syracuse at the time. And so this was this was my home, and nowhere in here is this sterile environment. And so I came to science, you know, from this kind of environment. Um, my mother, she painted, she did ceramics, and she, she does fabric design. She's, you know, sort of a jack of all trades. This is my favorite painting of my mother's. Um, here I am, um, with my dad's uh, students. So we had an art studio at my home and people came from all over the world to study with my father. And I consider these people uh, my family. Um, I didn't really know any different. Um, I just knew they were in my house kind of doing artwork with my parents. This is my mother up here. Um, she's actually an actress and some people in here are uh, chairs of departments of ceramics and, and uh, some other people are authors and musicians. So very enriched um, life growing up. 
And through the power of Facebook, someone had sent a picture of me. Um, I, here I am in 1975. And this is probably, if anyone knows me, last time I was kind of serious. But here I am, my dad's favorite uh, chair in the studio um, that I dearly loved. Um, and then here's a, a, a few other pictures. Uh, of, this is me at four years old. I'm getting crazier at the moment um, here. And so uh, lots of people who come into my life uh, um, really transform just my thought process of um, people, you know, just the diversity of people in my life was very much enriched by this environment, as you can imagine, and unusual in my ears. My, my two sisters are here. My brother wasn't born yet at this time. So, um, and, and the house I grew up was, was equally unusual in the backyard. So we would have sculptures around the house and my dad loved gardening and as do I still. And so he made a rose garden for my mother and he also would put quotes around the house. And if you come to my office, you also would see these kind of quotes, kind of inspirational quotes. And before I left for college, after being in this environment, um, he brought me to this quote here that he put from Picasso is that every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist when you grow up. Well, what I realized many years later, why my dad took me there is because my dad was trying to tell me is don't forget your who you are and, and you know at its core you are you know genetically an artist and don't forget that um, and so find some way to kind of keep that in your life and so I left this amazing and, and enriching um, household and I I had a long path I I'm sure this photo is a path of many people who are listening in the audience and so I went to Syracuse as an undergrad because my dad played football there and um, I was able to get almost a full ride uh, to go to school there and then I met a lot of faculty there that had come to Madison for graduate school and I ended up coming to Madison for uh, my PhD um, and I'm going to tell you the story about what happened here um, this was a turning point in my life and I place it right here over this bridge on the river and then I got my PhD obviously and then I went on to uh, Rebecca Heald and Barbara Myers lab at UC Berkeley for my postdoc. And then I came back to Madison as I really enjoyed my time here. And graduate school was really um, both a, a very troubling time in my life, but a very happy time in my life. And I really enjoyed doing science and living well here. So what happened in graduate school? So as the title alludes to, um, when I was, uh, my first lab I joined, I had a mentor say to me one day that I'm too creative for science and then I should, I don't really belong in so many ways. And of course, as you can imagine, what I just shared with you was not shared with this mentor. And obviously, if that was not shared, the mentor didn't really understand what, why this statement might have been so kind of damning and upsetting to me at that time. I left lab for two days. I didn't come back. I was trying to figure out, do I actually belong in science? Should I stay? And my father had said to me, I want you to go to the library and I want you to look for these texts. Unfortunately, so I had a father who was able to guide me through this kind of traumatic experience. Um, and, and the first person I certainly came up across, which my dad also knew, was da Vinci, right? So this is when scientists were artists. My dad was saying, you know, there's there's a couple of people on campuses that don't really understand um, the, the, the importance of arts and science, and maybe you found one. And so, um, but clearly da Vinci, da Vinci was an amazing scientist as his artist, as we all know. But I wanted to know more because as a biologist, I, I, I needed to see and as a woman in science, I wanted to see more places where art and science um, really was important. And so I stumbled upon Ramoni Cajal, the father of neuroscience. He also had trouble in his career. He was a painter and artist and the father wanted him to be a, a medical doctor, but we all know that these were the key talents to his success. And so these beautiful Purkinje cells that he drew. Um, the other person um, that probably comes to mind for a lot of people, but you might not be aware is Rosalind Franklin. And it was here, this was my kind of own self. You know, I realized at this point, I'd heard of this story of the discovery of DNA, but I realized that the onset of photography and imaging was happening is that this X-ray diffraction image was really, this was a visualization, a new way of seeing things. And this is why 
you know, she's attributed to discover this uh, to DNA. And if it wasn't for this beautiful photograph, that you wouldn't have made this sculpture. So models are basically sculptures and images of this. And so, of course, if it wasn't for Rosalind Franklin and photography, we wouldn't have this three-dimensional structure of, of how everything base pairs. And so um, after all that kind of self, kind of self-searching and trying to figure out whether I belong in science, um, I realize I, I, I do belong in science for a lot of reasons. And my dad helped me get there. And I also had my new mentor, the lab that I switched into, I realized that um, I do belong in science. And I had come across the quote that I'd like to share with you that kind of led me to believe that I also truly belonged in science. It was from this, um, Alison Gopnik is a psychologist at Berkeley. And she said that scientists are actually the few people who as adults who have productive time to, to just explore, play and figure out what the world is like. And their scientists are simply big children. And I realized that is totally me. And, and then I realized I was solidified that I belonged in science. So what else happened in graduate school that kind of solidified um, myself to keep pursuing? Well, I, I had a traumatic experience is that I failed my prelim twice. And I was told that I would probably have to drop out of school. And so, but I had the best mentor ever. So I switched to the lab of John White. And John White is, is the... Um, help create the confocal microscope. And he says, I got a D in math, but I invented the, the microscope. And so that was a very transformative comment to me that it was just an off from my mentor. I realized I was like, wow, I, you know, if I failed and my mentor failed, um, I guess that means I belong because look what John did. And so that was kind of, a, a, you know, as a mentor now myself, I realize things you say are really important. And that was kind of one sentence really made a difference in my life that day because I was really feeling like I should drop out of school, but I didn't, thank goodness. And so I'm very thankful for John for that. And the other thing that happened in graduate school was that I realized as I'd come where I'd worked on RNA splicing as an undergrad, um, and I didn't really like gels so much. I found these terribly boring and esoteric. And I realized when I started doing multi-photon and confocal imaging that I really fell in the process of mitosis, partly for how dynamic it is and beautiful and simple and fast and all of these things that I was seeing with my eyes. And this is a movie I made in graduate school that I still look at today. It's, and I see things every time I see something different, I watch the chromosomes, I watch the centrosomes, I watch different things each time and I discover new things. And I realized, wow, this is the kind of science I really wanna do. And I realized many years later why I fell in love with this because my favorite artist actually is Moreau. And if you notice anything, this looks like a nucleus to me and these look like centrosomes. So how did Moreau know what was inside the cell? Well, that's left to his imagination, but I realized that my art science life brought me to cell biology and certainly why I've you know, been a member and a part of ASCB for all of my, my career. And so, you know, who knew uh, that there is uh, centrosomes and nuclei in art, but it, it's definitely there. And that's why Moreau remains one of my favorite artists. So I work just, just for people who don't know me, I do work on cell, cell division and mitosis till this day, but I work on the last process is abscission and, and this new signaling organelle called the midbody, which I'm not going to get into today. So after I became a faculty, I realized that I can utilize my skills and my passion in the arts to um, have broader impacts um, with the public and, and to get not only young students and the public excited about science, but then into science and realize that this side is really important for um, communication of science. Um, I started as a grad student uh, making logos for the C. elegans uh, community. Um, this is probably the most famous one that I did. And then in addition to this, I started in 1997 as a grad student, the C. elegans art show, which has been going on still to this date. Um, in my own lab, I had dear friends say to me, I was making a big mistake and my career would be over if I started this art show um, because it would, would take away time from my work. It's now an ongoing event at the international meetings, and I just did one this past summer. Um, and, and even amazingly, when, when the Nobel laureate Sidney Brenner passed away in 2019, this art show made it into Forbes magazine as, as, as one of the reasons why the C. elegans community 
um, has such a wonderful uh, connected community because we really supported the arts in this project. And I'm indebted to the Seattle community for allowing me to do this all these years. I probably would have left science long ago if I couldn't do this art show. Um, but I'm thankful for them for embracing me and, and allowing me to do things. Um, and I want to show you what, what happened um, when I started the art show is I found, I realized that I'm not just as creative as lots of people are. And so wanted to share some of the things that happened over the years um, of, of some of the art. Um, one of the things, it, it is very, it's not very formalized. So we have poster session. We just put up about, we used to put up four posters. Now we have a whole giant row of posters and people can put up their art and we have very tough competition. Even National Academy members actually enter their own artwork. And so it is a community event and, and everyone votes, whoever gets the most votes in certain categories, they win. And we have lots of, um, lots of sponsors have realized this is an important way to support in our community and also get people's attention. Um, here's, one of my first winners, first place winners is Steve Johnson. At the time he was a postdoc, but um, in Andy Fire's lab, and he's now at BYU. So this is a stained glass C. elegans. So this is my first year doing the show and Steve Johnson submits this. And my, my, my mind was blown and I was so excited because I was meeting other people that really had a, found the beauty of C. elegans and wanted to articulate and communicate that to a world on sort of this macro scale. And I, I still, this is most astonishing thing, absolutely beautiful. And Steve, you know, and I maintain this really close friendship because of this, because it was like, wow. He, and he does this as well with his outreach projects as too. Another one of the first place winners was Abby Dernberg, who's one of close friends of mine. We also have microscopic images. And so this is probably the most beautiful gonad you've ever seen in your life. And it certainly won the first place for that because and Abby has such an artistic eye when it comes to communicating science. And over the years, things have changed and there's a lot more art and painting more so than microscopic images. Um, this beautiful painting by Varsha Singh who's an assistant professor at the Indian Institute of Science did this unbelievable painting, um, a watercolor. Um, and certainly she studies um, olfaction. Um, other there's line drawings and drawings that students see. So Annabelle Ebbing did this beautiful um, sort of early larval stage um, C. elegans. And we get some people doing amazing things to their lab coats. So uh, kind of almost looks like a, it could be an awesome tattoo. So Greta Sten at UCSD at the time um, made this beautiful and entered this lab coat. Um, additionally, I also like to um, submit things. And so I, since I love Moreau, sometimes I, I find Moreau painting. So this is the, uh, a take on Moreau blue and the, the lineage here, and this is the original. So a lot of them look similarly. So, but I don't submit for words, but I like to sometimes challenge myself to, to put uh, the worm somehow in a painting. Um, the other thing that I like to do is have themes. So every year we have a different theme, depends on what's happening that year. Um, I got really into Banksy and I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a graffiti uh, theme? And to uh, my amazement, um, to my amazement, um, we had in 2019, Philippe Dixheimer at the IMP in Vienna uh, submitted this. This was actually the world's largest model organism graffiti. And of course it's been painted over since then. This was in Vienna. And this launched a whole career for Philippe because people saw this on social media and it was just went viral. And he now paints lots of model organisms and other things on um, Institute walls. And so he just, he just got his PhD this year, um, this past year. And so um, I, I just was, this was an easy win and, and really remarkable. And it, it set around a bunch of other model organisms going, we got to do this too. And so the art show has been really amaz amazing to get people excited about science publicly. And it's not just Anna do it, it's everyone. And we realize that scientists are really creative and have talents um, all across the board, um, you name it. Um, it's, uh, these people are in C. elegans and they're also in science. And so when I became a faculty, I started also having the ability to do shows and installations within my building. And I wanted to share you some of those things that I'm doing. And this is part of my broader impacts um, of my NSF grants that I have. And so also collaborations um, um, 
with institutes here that ask uh, to kind of donate money to projects that they're doing on campus. So when I first got to my building here, I was in a new wing um, and I, it was an empty white wall. And so I asked the Dean, I walked up to the Dean's office at that time and I asked them, I wanted to have this idea. And he gave me 15,000 without even writing a grant. And I did this big installation all throughout this building. This is a, what actually got me into the art department. And so I think I'm one of the, the only science faculty in the country that is in an art department. I know there's others certainly, but we're a handful of us at this point. Um, but this, this kind of launched my ability to mentor art students in my laboratory. Um, and and I was, I'll share with you one of my MA students that was in my lab and we've continued to collaborate. So that art show led to a campus uh, science art competition called Tiny. Um, and this, this show, which was a competition on our campus, was also displayed and printed um, by Tandem Press, which is in Madison, um, which pr print, printed all of our microscopic images on archival paper and framed it. And the chancellor actually pitched in about $8,000 of own money to actually get this amazing project off and going. And this uh, got lots of press on, on NPR and PBS and Chicago Tribune, it kind of went everywhere. Um, we were, and I just was, again, amazed by the fact that my colleagues and students around campus were taking such amazing images I've never seen before. Um, and, and we're getting it out there to the public in a very easy and unique way. And this turned out to be the most popular show they ever had at the airport. They have shows all the time and the most amount of comments ever in a suggestion box. So there is a real need for the public, want from the public to see what stem cells look like, for example. What does really the, the fruit fly embryo look like? You know, people want to know and they're very curious about it. And from that, from that show, we now have this cool science image competition. And I want to share with you uh, some of the some of the winners um, that year. In some years, it's it's not all the biology. And this year, the chemist won. So this is the this was the clear winner that year for the tungsten nanostructure um, and the blood vessels of the brain and indium cobalt. Again, things that I always surprise me that I would have never, I've never seen before. We have a committee of not only scientists, but artists um, that come and we all agree what the, what, what the most beautiful one is out of that. And so this has been, um, uh, supported by Promega, which is in Madison, the, the art department, and also the McPherson Eye Research Institute that, that actually prints all of this work. And it's out down near the hospital and it's an open gallery down there in the McPherson Art Gallery. Here's um, work from 2019. This is a corn grain cross section. Here's a barnacle, which kind of looks like a watercolor. And this was one of the grand prize winners that year, which was iron ore and hematite inside Labradorite. This to me, and I was going to have people, if you're in the chat, what is the first thing um, that you think of when you see this, this image? You can certainly put in the chat if you like. And most people, a rainbow, yeah. Rainbow, yeah. What, what, yep, Jessica got it. So it looks like it looks like the Klimt's, right? So you got it, right? So, so a lot of things we see sometimes that come, they look like art pieces, right? So, and I ask you another one. So, what do you think this is? What does it look like to you? It could be an artist. It could be anything. What looks like a Monet? That's the number one thing. Yep, Starry Night. That's very good. What do you think this is in your body? Anything you think this is in your body? What could it be? In, it's in the human body. Cartilage, intestines, fat cells. Okay, bone. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what it is. It's actually the blood vessels in the back of your eye. And so my colleague Aki Kaden in his lab, Weiha Wali, this was a grand prize winner one of the years. Um, these are the blood vessels coming through the back of the eye, and these are the retinal cells. So. I was, when I saw this, my mouth dropped. And again, I also agree with people. There's the Monet and the Van Gogh and Starry Night. There's similar patterns there. But, and just to tell you why this is, this is actually a great image for outreach 
is because it looks like a Monet, because the public actually knows what a Monet and Van Gogh look like, right? And when I talk to large groups of young children, the greatest thing I remember from, I saw these kids when they see this, they come to me and they said, I did not know that the Monet was in my eyeball. And I think that's the greatest piece of how do you communicate this? Well, very simply, the art gets to the kids really quickly. And I tell them, yes, that's why I like to study science is because I can discover pieces of artwork, you know, in nature, you know, you see these pieces of, of artwork in the nature. And so that gets the kids to kind of connect really easily. So thanks for putting in the chat. So um, I, I, in addition to doing these campus art shows, I also collaborate with artists in the lab now that in the art department. And Oh, I first had an undergrad come to me and she she came to me and she was a performance artist and a costume designer. So Chanel Matsunami Gavro, and she's still a, a professional uh, performance artist and you can follow her. Certainly she came to me and she heard that I was a scientist who took artists in the lab. And so she wrote a, a, and got a Guggenheim Fellowship, which is a very big deal called Differentiate. And so she spent time in my lab. And we showed her pictures. We also showed her a microscope and kind of trained her. So she spent kind of one day a week doing this, but she got really interested in the seam cells of the C. elegans. And then she made fabric for this. And she did this whole performance uh, piece at, at the, the undergrad poster session. So she came out of a body bag and kind of differentiated and did this whole piece. And I, you know, this was um, the beginning of, of many collaborations with artists on campus. And so, um, um, she uses biological forms and designs and a lot of her costume design. And she really, truly still impresses me every time I see her. So follow her on Instagram and you'll find someone doing really remarkable things with science and art. The other person that came to me, so this is my first MA student I've, I've mentored. So Angela Johnson, she taught high school art um, and was an artist and photographer at trade and then decided to go back to school and get her master's. And so um, on, on my floor in my building in genetics, um, there's a, her show is called Translation. And so she spent a whole year, she not only, she spent time in my lab, but also took um, intro biology courses, uh, anatomy courses. And then she, she spent time with each couple labs on the floor. There was zebrafish lab, my worm lab, Drosophila and mouse. And so here's one of my favorite kind of images that she did here is that she took montages she kind of antiqued, you know, uh, zebrafish development and then put them on wood blocks. And so they kind of have a, there's kind of a textural component. And so we hung this on our floor. We hung this on our floor um, with, um, with command strips so we can easily take them down, but they're still up till this day. Um, and here's another piece that I'll, I find that there are times when your students some kind of remarkable. And so what she found is, after working with the microscope slides, why don't we blow and mount the images so uh, on giant slides? And so Angela came up with this idea of, of taking, she dropped pigments onto the coli and let them overgrow and she would make these kind of bacterial mandalas and then she mounted them. She mounted them on these, these giant microscope slides. And so these are just down the hall from me. Um, and, um, and then next, what she did, and I'm gonna show you a movie after this, she took C. elegans and watched their tracks on a plate and then she etched them on this box. And so she was learning how to do these sort of cabinet of curiosities. Um, and, and, and then inside this was a video projector of the, the worms tracking. And so I will play, play part of this show. And so let me turn this up. I'll answer your questions in a minute. Can everyone hear this? It's just music.
hope you heard all that. Just the music. So I got one more movie coming too. So, so that was Angela's MA piece. And then after she graduated, I, I hired her on my NSF grant. And I could certainly, people ask me all the time how this came about. So I wrote a, I wrote a grant. I was commissioned by the Biotech Center. And I'll tell you, tell you a little bit of story of this. So I was co commissioned by the UW Madison Biotech Center to fill this wall. So we have busloads of kids come to learn about DNA and evolution and phylogeny um, and all the things that go on in campus. This is a 40 foot wall. So this is a huge piece for a scientist. This is a massive, pro massive project. So this was my uh, broader impacts of my NSF that year. And so I, the Biotech Center was also willing to kick in a little bit of money for this. So I um, got Angela on board again to help with this project and part of the money went to Angela's salary, but also supplies for this. And so um, I work with my brother who w did this. So this is not a photograph. This is a drawing my brother did in CAD. This is how talented my brother is. And so the idea I came about with is, is that the biotech center wanted, they wanted a way to tell people about stem cells and sequencing and DNA all together. So and with Angela's you know, experience in photography and silk screening on on um, on glass. It kind of came with this idea of make kind of making little petri plates with either the cells or the sequences on it. Um, and this was submitted to my grant that year. And the program officer had called me and said, "If you put fifty thousand in your grant," so I didn't realize how much I could put in. I think I put in initially ten thousand. He says, "Well, if you put fifty thousand in, we'll fund this," because I realized at the point. It, it was going to cost a lot more. Um, and sometimes your plans and grants don't turn out to exactly because you realize the feasibility to do all this and the cost would, is, was much more than it was going to turn out to be. And we did this from experimenting. So here's Angela uh, working on parts of the piece. And, um, and I'm going to walk you through um, how we went about doing this. So we get this money, I hire Angela, and we kind of work on doing the planning. And just like we, you would with lab meeting, we do the same thing. So we have weekly lab meetings. She came to lab meetings. She would give lab meeting about where she was. We would mock up test samples and we had two, two and 3D mock-ups and we had to work with building staff. And so we ended up having to have reinforcement of the wall because it would have cost us about 17,000 more to actually create that image that we had more and we didn't have that in the budget and we couldn't get it from the biotech center. So we ended up with this reinforcing it with wood. And I wanna let everyone know is that part of the process is, is I always want students to be learning part of the process of how to communicate science. So we enlist as part of the NSF grant too is how do we disseminate what we're doing more broadly is we make YouTube videos, but we worked with Matt Norman, who was an undergrad videographer at that point, learning how to do these things. So he came on board and came to lab meetings and he videotaped us on multiple uh, steps throughout this process. And you'll see parts of his movie at the end. And so there, there's an education component to all sides of this here. So this is what it ended up looking like. So this is, this is the wood reinforcement. This is a sandblasted glass. So we worked with the MRSA, NSF MERSEC. This is a grant over in engineering. They have a maker space where we sandblasted the 16S or 18S ribosome from different model organisms that are used on campus. And then we, we, we sat them on these little um, kind of holders above uh, a mirror. And so, and I will show you in the next picture actually what we're trying to do here. So what we're trying to do is show young students that here's the same gene in different species that's different lengths, it's different codes and all, all that, but it's all related. But, but also importantly that there's, there's double strands in DNA and, there, and, and, and then you could see this more better with a couple of these images I'm showing here. So we also realize that the light path, so what you're reading here is actually the reflections, hence the genetic reflections is that we had to figure out the light path and also pay for that light path to be installed so that you can read this. And so this is a little bit about this piece. And here, uh, my friend Alejandro took this picture of me as you can actually see that the innovation in this was the light path had to hit correctly and the way we, we spaced the fonts, the, the text and the fonts of the sequences created a, a complementary strand of DNA. And so that kind of blew me away. And that all happened at lab meeting that we figured out how to do that. 
And so, you know, we were just uh, so excited about that. And so here's a movie that, that Matt um, helped us put together. I've chopped it a little bit, but we're, we're going to interview the people who work in, in our outreach, um, our Biotrack Center, who, which does a lot of the outreach with the young students. And so they're, they're gonna tell you about um, what this um, project means to them in terms of science education. Public art is important in this building in particular because it gives our visitors a chance to see ideas that otherwise they might not be able to see. So a lot of things in science you can't see visually with the naked eye. Like if you ask students to see DNA with the naked eye, they say no, but then here you are, you're literally walking by it. So take something abstract and makes it concrete. I run with Tom Zinnin, the teaching lab. So we have K through 12 kids come in um, and we run workshops with them, specifically DNA based. We start them at the phone and we discuss that um, that macromolecule and the shape of it and how it runs. And then as we walk down the hall, we talk about those letters. And especially if you have like the little kid, they're like, wait a second, this is the four letters that we just talked about. And like some of them are like literally like that. And they'll like, they'll read <laughs> for 30 seconds, they'll like read out loud all the letters. And they're like, huh. So to make like that direct connection, the, the fact that they can interact with it so closely, I think there's a really big deal with this art exhibit. There's also cool things like reviews. If you don't have the light on, you can't really read the names of the model organisms. So they start getting the idea that lighting matters not only in art, but in things like microscopy and how we try to see things in the life sciences as well as in the arts. No. So I, I, I hope that movie kind of gave you an example about how that process was in that very end. So Tom Zinnin um, kind of said it at best is that we also are teaching the students about light path and light is important for visualizing certain, certainly all of the beautiful things we see on microscopes. And I think that was a little piece that when we were thinking about the process, we wanted to be able to teach the students that. And, and, and what I'm showing you now is part of the NSF grants, in order to have the NSF grants, you cannot install something just in one place. It needs to be disseminated. So that's why we make these movies. And we also, part of the money goes to creating a smaller version of this. And so we etched the same things. And we, we this was one of our, this is just prior to COVID. So this was at Lawrence University in the Riston Art Gallery. And so um, Angela and myself uh, we traveled traveled there. We give a talk about art and science, and we, and we do this together. And when we have the piece, and so Google had a had a, a, a contacted me just prior. They Google wants it in in um, at their headquarters, but it's kind of COVID kind of put a damper on that. But the goal is that we we want this to travel widely and broadly, um, and we also have these movies too. And so all these kind of pieces have to be thought about when you're doing your your NSF broader impacts, for example. Um, and these are the kind of projects that be certainly covered with the NSF Broader Impacts funding. Um, in addition to that, um, I wanted to think more broadly is how can I get not only, you know, more students involved in this, but how can we disseminate more broadly? And so it dawned on me, I was, you know, kind of watching a few people um, uh, on Twitter do a few things with coloring books. And I, I said, well, why don't we do a coloring book? And so I, I, I talked to my two undergrads, so Elif and Caitlin, all of my undergrads who come to my lab have an interest in, in science and art. And so they usually have either, a, usually an art minor. So I said, hey, why don't we do this? And so because I'm in the life science communication department as well, I can give them credit. So we spent a whole year on this and we spent, um, kind of split up the work um, uh, on doing that. And I kind of worked on the text with that, with our outreach uh, program. And so um, Elif and, and Caitlin, very talented students, um, Elif would like to go to medical school and Caitlin wants to um, work for the CDC or WHO. And so both of them ha have, you know, they have different kind of um, techniques and their art style is, is a little bit different, but we kind of learned how to mesh it. So we kind of split the book up kind of half half and I'll show you some of those images. And I think I just wanted to share with Elif. So these undergrads are learning how to communicate science more broadly in a project like this. But Alif came to me and she says, well, you know, I, I'm going to, I want to be a medical doctor one day. And I realized that this is helping me understand that I might need to 
um, draw or visualize for my patients, you know, a complex idea or a treatment. And I said, yeah, exactly. You might, you have to be conscious and, and understanding of that. And so she really feels, you know, to me, this project really impacted her in a lot of ways. And so I'm going to share with you some drawings. This is an ABC book of genetics and model organisms. So it starts with A for Arabidopsis. And there's F is for fruit fly. N is for nucleus. So this is a leaf. And a leaf has done these little kind of, she has little motifs. So she has her own spin on it, which I love. And then because of coronavirus broke out in the middle of doing this book, we added virus for the V in there. Um, and then here's Caitlin's beautiful work. Again, different kind of style, but similar. So Z is for, for Z maize or corn. And I think what I love about projects like that, um, like this, is that it able to go out over the world. And even during COVID, I was Zooming with kids who had bought the coloring book. We're so excited just to meet a scientist who did art and we're very excited about the coloring book. And certainly the best part of being about a scientist is getting kids excited about this. And so here was one of our, our first you know, fans of the book and they were sending in pictures of, of the book with us. So I'd like to thank you for listening to me and um, I'm kind of right on time here. And so I have about 15 minutes left for questions. You can put it in the questions um, or you can put it in the chat and thank you for listening. Let's see. Um, I have a question from Kanika. Is it okay if you explain the context a little bit, what, what the person meant by too creative for science? So um, meaning the ideas and thoughts or experiments are unreal to be true. Um, what I took from that is, is that this person thought that at the time, I think that someone like myself in my background didn't belong and it was a one-off and that's all I kind of took from it. I'm certain this person doesn't feel this way about me to this day. You know, this was my former mentor, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of what I meant. So we did that one. And so Greg has, Greg Eaton has a question. I teach cell biology and my honors class decided to make our special focus, focus mixing art and cell biology. Do you have any ideas or suggestions for assignment or project for non-artists to dip their toes in and get creative. I mean, you could do a lot of things if you're doing cell biology. I mean, you can, you know, certainly have people paint or use clay, do lots of different things of, you know, observation is really important in science. So teaching that, having them observe and draw. And most people will say, oh, we're just, I'm not an artist, but you are in some way. People have their own way of communicating things or working groups. Um, I can certainly help you offline too, Greg, as well. Um, but there's lots of different ways you could do this. Um, it depends on the size of the class, what the age is, and vice versa. Um, but yeah, I, I, you'll be surprised that people get exci really excited about um, doing this in general. Let's see, Louisa Campos, um, how to communicate arts and science if you don't have this profound contact with the arts yet? I'm a first year biology grad student. Although I find arts interesting, I don't know how to put these two things together in order to disseminate science. So depending on what kind of science in, you're in, Louisa, is that um, at least for publishing, you, you, you may learn how to use um, Photoshop and Illustrator. These are the ways that you're communicating the science. And so learning those programs are really helping you communicate your science. And so I'd say, I try to say there is a skill to that. There's also a skill, you're just the way you see things. If you're using microscopy, the way you see things and the way you do um, hue intensities and color, these are all kind of little bits of being sensitive to um, art and design. And so um, and you use art in different ways. In addition, you're also communicating. You don't have to, you're communicating often as a scientist through the visual. So the best place you can kind of start is actually with a keynote or PowerPoint talk is work on those things is that is all communication. So you really need to put words with your text on slides. And so those are, you know, that those whole programs are all art, art based. Um, of course, artists use those all the time. And so learning how to use those um, programs are really helpful in science. Let's see, Kanika is back. So inspiring. Um, how did you negotiate a position with the arts department? And what is the breakdown for your lab, Science for Artists? Okay, so I didn't negotiate a position. They just said, we want you in our department. 
<laughs> so it is of a, a, it's an advantage for to have a scientist in the department also for showing um, campus people that art is important in science is, is that because artists always get la lack of funding and scientists always get the funding the fact that I'm over there showing people that what they're doing in the art department and students are taking those classes are important to what I do in the science that me ha having them in the department is of a value to them and so that's how I'm there I'm on the executive committee of the arts department and so uh, that was an easy and I didn't really have to jump through hoops or do a talk. It's just I have to be who I am. And so um, and kind of the breakdown of my lab. So my lab, we usually have um, one artist that come in with my projects if I have them working on National Science Foundation. But every single person in my lab has an interest in the arts. It's usually a gimme They they come to me. Hey, I love, I, you know, I'm a genetics major or wherever, but I love art. Can I come to your lab? And so those are the people I love because I always have things, I always have images or we're gonna communicate through a schematic. I have those students, they jump on those and have those. So those are to my advantage. So, but usually kind of an artist in residence, I'd say there's usually one, um, but in general, we're all kind of artists besides myself, I guess, uh, Kanika. Um, next question is Andrea, a great talk. I'm wondering if you have any advice on getting administration in our building on board with installing artwork. Particularly, it's never been done before in the building. You're wondering how I did or if I have advice. So if I have advice. So uh, they had never done it before, but they were super excited about it. So we went with them. They do they do install things. So you have to, they know how to install and they do, there is public work around our campus. So you have to kind of work with them and it takes some planning. We had to work with glazers that work with glass. And so I'd never had experience with that, but it, it took us several weeks to kind of figure it out. We also had to do that before ordering any of our mounts. And so all that wood going on the wall was, an, was another group of physical plants on campus. So, um, and our person in, in our loading dock who knows how to do those things helped coordinate it. So th they're all acknowledged in this project because we couldn't have done it without them. But um, the other thing that we do with Angela's project, we just stuck it ourselves with command strips. So that I'd say is the easiest way. The, Command strips are great for doing um, public art and science buildings, and you don't have to ask anyone because if you get in trouble, they'll take it down. But you know that's that's why I'd say is start start at command strips. Um, there's an anonymous attendee. Could you describe your balance in your science and art endeavors when you began as a professor? So uh, I guess the question. I mean, how do I balance my science and art? I just do it all the time, regardless. I just. The balance is, it's not really a balance, it's just who I am. And if I didn't do the art that I do, I probably would not be, I would have quit science a long time ago. So the balance is kind of, you know, understanding who I am and being confident that what I'm doing is of value to the science community in addition to the public. And so I'm really, you know, for me is I have to do this in my life in order to be like sane, I think is like, I have to do art. And I do art out, you know, I, I learned how to, you know, I did ceramics with my lab at this summer for a month and we do fun things after work with art. So I just, I think it's part of like, when you're sometimes in a ceramic studio working on stuff, you think about lab a lot and you think about stuff when you're just, it's almost meditative and, and, and amazing ideas come out of those experiences. So I think it's really important part of science. Next question is how do you balance your time? So another, I just, I, I just, I carve out time because it's important. If I have an artist in the lab, I make those hour meetings a week as I did with any one-on-ones in my lab. And so I make time because it's important to me. Um, and if it has to be on the weekend or any other time or late in the evening, which the coloring book was a lot late evenings with us and the students. And so we, we did it. And I think the other bit is I, all, all those students, like the coloring book was, a uh, those were, that was four credits of work. So two semesters of work. So that's where I get credit for teaching and then the students are getting credit as well. So it's it's built in. And so I try to do that because that's how I kind of carve those the time out um, for doing that. Uh, question from Andrea again, are these particular grants you would recommend for getting specifically? No, these are NSF grants. So NSF grants all have broader impacts and the broader impacts, it, 
can be up to $50,000 of doing, how do you disseminate your work more broadly? And so I chose to do art in that regard. Um, um, you, we, you certainly can write grants that are just for the art, but this is actually the other majority of that grant goes to my science and support everyone in the lab. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to the Q&A, but I can go certainly to the questions. Um, what advice do you have for those wanting to engage science communicators, but have effectively no base in artistic visualization? Well, I would just get an artist on board. I would say for those of you wanna engage more, um, I also hire an outside artist, science artist from my lab, because I also don't have time sometimes to do things. I can do things to an extent, but sometimes I get overwhelmed with my work. So I also hire and contract out an artist. So I would say, find these, there's undergrads on campus, there's professional science artists that can help you and you can hire them if, if you know, um, and you can always find them. I'm certainly, I follow tons of people on um, Instagram and Twitter, you can find them there that be more than willing to be hired to do things like that. Um, where can you find the coloring books on Amazon? You can Google genetic reflections. Um, Andre, uh, thank you very much. Such an interesting, if you were an artist instead of a research, would you be more happy now? <laughs> I, I think, so here's what I love. I mean, that's a great question is like, would I be happier? I said, I'm a happier because I am a, just a scientist and an artist. And I was talking to another undergrad today at Sockness, at the Sockness conference. And I think for me is I would not be in science if I was not doing art as well. And I really love getting people excited and young students about science. I love teaching a lot. And I think for me, as I teach my students how to communicate science and use art in my classroom. And so in my science classroom, I do the art. And so I really like it because it changes the way I teach um, and students experience science. So if you get in a science classroom and all of a sudden the teacher is saying, hey, we're gonna visualize these things, that's unusual for a student and they love it and they engage in different ways. And so I'm happy to just be myself and be a science artist, but you know, certainly you know, doing science art and outreach is something I really love doing. Um, Alid Cruz, uh, my questionnaire is, there any forum workshop or any kind of venue to promote science art and you can get more involved in? There's this whole science art community now on Twitter. Um, and there's a video, a uh, stochastic gallery it's called. If you email me, I can get you hooked up with that. And there's a bunch of science artists that talk once a month about what they're doing. Um, there is um, data visualization programs now that people that have popped up around universities. Um, I can connect you with a lot of people if you email me. Um, are there many life science communication departments in the US? Not that many. Madison turns out to be number one in the world for life science communication, which I found out. Um, and they, and, and so um, they also have a PhD minor here. So our PhD students minor in life science communication. Um, and they're really, really tremendous program, but there's not that many departments in the US. Um, what's my favorite medium, paint, photography, ink, something else? I guess I like, so I, my minor is in ceramics as an undergrad. I do like ceramics, but um, I think other people also know me as I also like cake. Sugar is also my other medium is so, so every uh, figure of uh, paper that I publish, I make it in cake form. And so that became an easy way and cheaper way. And, and, and the public loves cake and especially science cake. So I started doing that. Um, but I think um, the other thing I like to do is jewelry. I'm kind of a beater. I like to bead and make jewelry. And so it just depends. I like a lot of things. I do like watercolor too. So um, I think now to the chat. Oh, so Kanika, I asked a question about, one question was also about the techniques on the mandalas. Um, so those are actually... Angela went to um, Michael's and got pigments and we dumped them on top of OP50 bacteria and let them grow. And then she kind of mirrored them and manipulated them in Photoshop. And so we have a drawer in lab, that's our art drawer. So we paint with bacteria, we, we put pigments on them and grow and kind of play around with that. So that's what she did. 
Um, thank you very much. If you were an artist instead of a research, would you be more happy? There's another one. Yeah. Could you please give examples of software and programs that could be used for constructing images and presentation and posters? So I love Keynote. I'm an Apple person through and through. I don't like PowerPoint at all. I do a lot of stuff in Keynote now because it's very, very powerful. Um, I use Illustrator a lot. Um, and then I oftentimes I hand draw things. I will hand it to my science artist if I can't draw it fast enough. I can draw it in Illustrator, um, but sometimes I can do things. I can do things now um, that way. But I think a lot of people are now finding out BioRender to me is is like a game changer for a biological scientists. So I highly recommend BioRender. Um, let's see, Sharisa Martin. We'll keep track of. Uh, let's see. Um, Ali Cruz, great presentation. I, I felt identify with your story. My question, is there any form? Okay, I already answer that, right? Let's see. Anything else? Andrea, I'd love for you to come give a talk at undergrads. I would love to, happy to do that. Contact me. So thanks everyone for the amazing questions. I hope you do disseminate these same things at your own institution or your K through 12 institution. I'm happy to give a talk and I love working and talking with young kids about science. Um, and so thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for giving this great presentation. Thank you so much.